Hello, my name is John Sanfilippo. I am the East Region Well Inspector for the Oregon Water Resources Department. Today, I am going to give you a brief introduction to groundwater hydraulics, which in fluid mechanics terms is referred to as flow through porous media, but ultimately both terms just describe the physical properties of how groundwater or how water moves underground. Groundwater flow paths vary greatly in length, depth, and travel time from points of recharge to points of discharge in the groundwater system. Flow path length is a function of the distance you are from the recharge area. Depth is dictated by local geology and travel time is a function of both distance and local geology. On this particular diagram, the blue lines are showing groundwater flow paths from areas of recharge in the uplands in the center of the diagram to areas of discharge on the right and left of the diagram. This diagram also shows how time varies with depth, especially when it flows through a confining bed. The tan lines going from left to right. Confining beds is a bit of a misnomer. Water can travel through them because they are not often, oops. Entirely, they are not often entirely impermeable, but they are much less permeable than the blue areas labeled aquifer um, because there is much less pore space. And as the diagram points out, this change in permeability or pore space results in travel times of hundreds and thousands of years greater than the travel times in the unconfined aquifer system. Also, because they have a smaller pore space, it takes more energy to cross that boundary. This is why when you drill through a less permeable structure into something with a higher permeability, the water will often rise in the borehole or static up. In this diagram, there are two different types of discharge. One is a pumping well, removing water from, a, from deep in an unconfined aquifer. And two, the stream that is being supported by, shallow, by the shallow unconfined aquifer, which in this instance is called a gaining stream, which is defined as a stream that is supported by a shallow unconfined aquifer. Streams can go from gaining streams to losing streams as often as seasonally. What is groundwater? Groundwater is the saturated zone where the water completely occupies the fractures of the rock or pores of the sediment. This diagram is attempting to illustrate that there is water in the unsaturated zone that can be retained through molecular attraction. Water is a polar molecule, which means it is partially charged. I'm not going in I'm not going to go into effective nuclear shielding and how that relates to more electronegative atoms which in a covalently bonded molecule can cause a partial charge. If you wanna Google why water can be sticky, try searching van der Waals, um, which is spelled V-A-N space D-E-R space W-A, or yeah, W-A-A-L-S. Um, it was a Dutch scientist uh, or uh, either van der Waals force or hydrogen bonding or just remember that water can be sticky because it's partially charged. Common stream groundwater interactions. On the top left corner, we have a gaining stream, which means a shallow unconfined aquifer is feeding or discharging water into the stream and maintaining a base flow for the stream. On the top right corner, we have a losing stream where the stream is losing or discharging water or recharging the shallow unconfined aquifer. On the bottom left, we have a disconnected stream where there is no saturated zone between the shallow unconfined aquifer and the stream. They are not directly connected. Last, on the bottom right, we have a bank storage stream. This occurs during high flows when the permeability of the banks and the stage of the stream cause an increased flow into the banks of the channel. This may continue to a point where the entire floodplain is saturated with water. 
how could you determine at the time of drilling a well, what scenario the stream next to you is most like? If the static water level um, in the well for an unconfined aquifer is higher than the current stream elevation, then it is pretty likely that the stream is a gaining stream. Vice versa, if the water level is lower than the stream height, then it is likely to be a losing stream and the stream is likely controlling the static water level or affecting the static water level in the well. As I stated in an earlier slide, streams can change from gaining to losing, to disconnected, to bank storage, all in the span of one year. What is important to note from this slide is that in shallow unconfined and unconsolidated aquifers, the streams can have a substantial impact on water levels in the well and can cause variations in static water levels as much as many feet per year. Stream flow capture. Here is an example of how wells can intercept stream recharge and affect stream flow for a gaining stream. In this diagram, the arrows are showing the flow direction of the water in a shallow unconfined aquifer system. A, the uppermost diagram, is what the system looks like prior to any changes. Um, this system is, a, is, is in a steady equilibrium state, basically a natural setting that has adjusted and formed over time to reach something natural or predictable. B is what it looks like after a well and a pump have been installed near the stream and pumping begins. The cone of depression, the shallow V shape of the water table has just begun but there is still water flowing into the stream. The lower diagram C is what the pumping effects look like over a longer period of time. The V-shaped cone of depression is deeper. Drawdown has increased. Depression, uh, depressing this drawdown has increased, depressing the static water level in the well downward. And it has now reached a point where the gradient to the stream has completely flipped and the well is now intercepting water to the stream and pulling water from the stream. The takeaway is simply that shallow alluvial wells near streams are very much affected by the base flow of the stream and can also have a significant impact on the base flow of the stream. These relationships are seen a lot in shallow alluvial wells near the Snake River in places like Huntington and Ontario. The Snake River elevation and static water level elevations in the wells proximal to the river have very similar levels. And when the Snake River, or, yeah, when the Snake River stage decreases in late summer, so does the static water level in all the wells near it. This slide is showing a response to pumping. This diagram should look familiar since it was taken from the last slide. Notice the red line. The area between the red line and the dashed line represents the area, or if we envision this as a 3D representation, the volume loss due to pumping. The volume loss is proportional to the area between the old water table and the new water table, but isn't equal to the area. To figure out how much water was taken from the system, we first calculate the volume of the cone of depression, this sort of V shape to the water table forming around the well, then multiply that volume by the pore space of the soil or rock formation. If the unit, or yeah, if the unit this well is drilled into is mostly alluvial gravels and the voids between those gravels make up about 40% of the total space, then we would multiply the volume loss by 40% or 0 0.04. And that would give us the total water removed from the system. The relationship between pore space and the unit is important. The larger the pore space, the more storage uh, is available and the faster water can move. Fluid mechanics teaches us that as a fluid like water gets closer to a surface, its speed or fluid velocity approaches zero meaning that the closer you are to a surface, the slower the water moves. Thus, the larger the voids or bigger the pore space, the faster water can move in that formation. Your 
probably intuitively knew this already, gravel formations give us better flow rates than clay formations. Bernoulli's equation. Uh, this is the first of two basic groundwater equations I'm going to go over. Uh, I tried to limit the amount of math in this presentation as much as possible. What I hope you get from this and the other equation is a basic understanding of the terminology and hopefully some of how various components relate to one another. In Bernoulli's equation, P is pressure, uh, the funny shaped P um, is, is, is density. Um, it's referred to as the Greek letter rho. V is velocity. G is the gravitational constant. And Z is elevation head. Total head is the total elevation of water in the well. In groundwater, we refer to water elevation as head. Each term in this equation represents some component of the head, whether it's pressure head, velocity head, or elevation head, or total head. This particular equation has an extra term that is not super relevant to groundwater flow. It is the velocity head component. Since groundwater velocity is relatively slow, the velocity head component is minimal in terms of its impact on the total head. And as a result, not super important to calculate when in reference to groundwater. So as you can see, we've simplified Bernoulli's equation by omitting the velocity head component by making the assumption that water levels in the system are near static, which means not moving um, or moving very little, we are left with elevation head, pressure head equaling total head. As outlined in the diagram, elevation head is the elevation of the bottom of the well relative to sea level, and pressure head is equal to the elevation of water in the well. And both combined equal the total elevation of water in the well, or total head. The reason why we use this equation is it allows us to change between pressure and elevation of water relatively easily. If you were to apply units to pressure head, you would see that everything cancels out in terms of units, leaving only a length. And elevation head is also only a length, as is total head. So we can go from pressure to elevation and back really easily. Pressure is a force per mass or force mass per area. Gravity is a force. Density is a volume or a mass per volume. Um, once the mass, force, and length units are divided out, all you are left with is a length of water for a given pressure. Since gravity and density are relatively constant, I say relatively since gravity does vary a bit depending on where you are on the planet, and density varies with temperature and dissolved solids, with that said, it doesn't vary that much. So assuming they are all constants is a pretty reasonable assumption. Now that we can treat pressure as a length, we can calculate the static water level of an artesian well in terms of elevation. We can also calculate the amount of pressure at a formation if the water statics above the water bearing zone. If we know the elevation of the top of the artesian zone, and let's say it's, it's a flowing artesian well, and we have pressure at the wellhead, we can also use the pressure at the top of the well, the depth to the top of the artesian zone, and calculate the water pressure at the top of the artesian zone, and calculate it if, if the casing were to extend, many feet in the air, how high the water would actually go above the casing until it reaches an equilibrium state. If you have the pressure, divide it by the density times gravity, you can get a length. If you have a length and you want to know the pressure, you can multiply it by density and gravity and you will get the pressure. The math of groundwater velocity. The equation in the top middle of the slide middle of the slide is referred to as Darcy's equation or Darcy's law. This equation calculates the speed or velocity that groundwater moves from one location to another. 
The Q stands for Darcy's velocity. Uh, it is the velocity across a unit area, also referred to as a flux. If you look at the diagram to the left, where there are two, oh, sorry, where there are two arrows that say flow, some circles inside of a box and some squiggly arrows inside the box. This is meant to represent that water molecules do not take a straight path to get from one side of the box to the other. They curve around various sediments and flow through fractures. The velocities calculated using Darcy's law only calculate the speed water moves from one side of the box to the other, not the actual velocity of each individual molecule is moving which is actually faster since it isn't a straight path from one side to the other. I don't know how useful it is to know the actual velocity of water in the ground, since we are usually much more interested in how long it takes water or how long it takes water to, for instance, move from one, from an area of recharge to a particular landowner's well. If you wanted to know the actual velocity water is moving, you could simply divide Darcy's velocity by the effective porosity, which is slightly different than the total porosity or pore space that we discussed before in earlier slides. It is the pore space that contributes to most of the movement of groundwater. An example would be a shale formation with fractures. In a saturated formation, all the pores are occupied by water, but most of the water moves via the fractures in the shale instead of in the fine pores in that particular formation. Again, Q is Darcy's velocity, a flux. K is hydraulic conductivity. In math terms, we would call it a constant of proportionality, which basically means it is the ratio between two values in a proportional relationship. Hydraulic conductivity is made up of the intrinsic permeability, how permeable, how permeable is the formation, or material in relation to how easily water can move through it, the density of water, the acceleration due to gravity, all divided by dynamic viscosity, which is measured, which is a measure of how much force needs to be applied to make a fluid move through something. With all of that said, you don't really need to know, you really don't need to remember anything beyond Darcy's velocity as a flux, or an average travel time omitting a nonlinear flow path um, in which water molecules move. Hydraulic conductivity is proportional to how porous the formation is. Everything else is pretty much a constant. And this uh, DHDL, which, which we are finally getting to, is the difference in the elevation of the water from one point to another divided by the distance between those two points. DH is the difference in head from one location to another. If the water in the well is 20 feet and the water in the other well is 15 feet, then DH would equal five. And DL is the distance between those two measuring points. Uh, let's call it 500 feet. So then DH DL is equal to five divided by 500, which is ultimately equal to 0 0.01. Now that we have covered what makes up Darcy's equation and we have learned that water or the movement of water from one location to another is a function of pore space in the formation and the difference in elevation divided by the distance between two elevation points, let's discuss some numbers. On the right-hand side of the slide are some values of hydraulic conductivity for various geologic units. As you can see, they vary by orders of magnitude within a certain formation. Sandstone, for instance, can be as little as 10 to, 10 to the negative 10 to as high as 10 to the negative 6. For those of you that need a little refresher on their exponent rules, that's a difference of roughly 10,000 meters per second. These values are rough approximations. I was always taught that if you can get uh, a, hydro a hydraulic conductivity value within an order of magnitude, somewhere within plus or minus 100 meters per second that you were doing pretty good. You can also see the difference between gravels that are 10 to the negative three to 10 to the negative four compared to clays, which are 10 to the negative nine to 10 to the negative 11. The difference between 10 to the negative three and 10 to the negative nine is six zeros or roughly 1 million times slower. As you can see in the table, 
The speed at which water moves underground is greatly affected by the amount of pore space available. And some formations can vary a lot in terms of how readily or how fast water can move more within and through them. Sorry about that. I meant to hit the pause button so I can get a glass of water and accidentally ended the sharing. Uh, so let's get back to it. Um, you've seen this diagram a few times before. There's a well that is pumping, drawing down the water table, creating this V-shaped cone of depression. Now that we have some knowledge of Darcy's law and how it applies to the speed or velocity that groundwater moves, let's apply it to this scenario. As I stated before, if we can get within an order of magnitude with the hydraulic conductivity, we're doing pretty good. So I think it would be more than appropriate to, do, to assume that it is constant for the entire formation of, let's call it river gravels in this case. We have decided on a, on a value for K, let's say it's something like three times 10 to the negative three meters per second. River gravels are particularly porous. So now we need to decide on values for DHDL. If we pick a value of DH near the number one and next, and next to the casing and calculated a value for Q versus near the number two and just, and just outside the casing, what do you think the difference would be in our Q values? Number one, is a larger change over a longer distance, while number two is less of a change in head over a shorter distance? The answer is two would have a greater velocity. The value calculated for one is going to be an average of slow and fast moving water given the curve, because we are using a straight line to represent a curved water table. Since the dashed line represents the water table, then it is effectively representing the slope at all points. Since K is constant, the steepest slope, or DHDL, correlates to the fastest moving water. Water accelerates as it approaches the well and as drawdown begins to take place. This is why wells recover fastest at first and then start to slow down during their recovery to static. Because initially the water is very steep next to the well, but as it fills up, the steepness declines as does the water velocity flowing back into the well. Staying with Darcy's law and the V-shaped cone of depression, that curved shape of, of the water table as it approaches a well during drawdown can be mathematically approximated using what is called a well function. I don't want, you, I don't want to go into a bunch of detail on the topic of well functions as they can be and how they can be used to calculate hydraulic conductivity or transmissivity, which is hydraulic conductivity times the aquifer thickness or storativity, how much an aquifer can store or release from storage because it involves a lot more math. I just wanted to reiterate that the shape of the water table approaching the well under pumping conditions always will take this general shape. It will be less aggressive in highly conductive transmissible aquifers. Think of large hydraulic conductivity values, coarse gravels, glacial till, highly fractured interflow zones and basalt that show little drawdown and much deeper in low conductivity systems. Think low hydraulic conductivity, um, your clays, your shales, your siltstones, um, which would have a lot of drawdown. Water closest to the well will always be moving the fastest while it will gradually be moving slower and slower the further you get away from the well. Artesian and flowing artesian wells and the conditions that create them. First off, uh, there's a difference between artesian and flowing artesian wells as defined by the Water Resources Department. An artesian well is a well that has a higher static water level than the water bearing formation. A flowing artesian well has a static water level above land surface. Uh, I hope to find a nice graphic to discuss this topic, but I couldn't find anything I liked. This is my poor attempt at making one myself. 
It doesn't look very realistic, but the principles that it represents do mimic realistic scenarios. The white inverted lines on the left and right are meant to represent mountains or hills, which I'm calling the recharge areas. The red lines are meant to represent the water elevations in each aquifer. The black lines are meant to represent impermeable flow boundaries, denoting one aquifer from the other. The brown lines in the center, or the brown line in the center, is meant to represent valley bottom or land surface. The paired yellow lines are meant to represent wells drilled in, drilled at different depths. And the little inverted black triangles are meant to denote static water levels in each well. The inverted black triangle is a common indicator of static water level in groundwater text and diagrams. Also less obvious is the elevation of the inverted triangle is slightly lower than the water table in the subsequent recharge area. This is intentional and represents the energy loss due to flow through porous media. Some might think of aquifers as free flowing. That is not entirely correct. The porous structure of an aquifer creates a resistance to flow, meaning that there is, there is an energy loss between the recharge area and wherever the well is drilled. This is why in the earlier slides, the water table was always higher than the stream in a gaining stream. Because for the water to flow through porous media, there needs to be a gradient to push it. And that gradient is a function of the recharge rate, the porosity of the structure, um, less porous, smaller holes, steeper gradient, more porous, bigger holes, less gradient. The first aquifer below the valley bottom is an unconfined aquifer. Since there is no confining layer leading to a pressure gradient, the water table in the well is equal to the depth of the water first found. The next aquifer down has an impermeable flow boundary restricting water from rising above it. Once that boundary is drilled through, the water rises above the water bearing zone denoting it is under pressure. When this happens, it is almost always an indicator that the formation or material overlying the water bearing zone was creating some resistance or restriction of flow in the upward direction. As we go deeper and encounter a third water bearing zone, the water is now under even enough pressure to flow at land surface. And likely the formation directly overlying it is even more impermeable to hold, hold back a greater amount of pressure. The fourth aquifer is under an even greater pressure and like the third flowing at land surface, and likely has a very impermeable flow boundary directly overlying it. Keep in mind Bernoulli's equation where elevation of water is directly proportional to pressure, even though the drill rig is sitting in the same elevation for all four wells, the total pressure at the top of each well or water bearing zone, in this case increases with depth because the total length of water above each zone increases. The more water, statics uh, up from the water bearing zone, the higher the pressure that particular water is under. Department pump tests. The water resources department doesn't often fund or pay for pump tests, but we are interested in collecting data during pump tests. This slide shows an example of the most ideal scenario to collect data during a pump test. Uh, I robbed the slide from another presentation that didn't source where they found it. That's why it says source question mark at the bottom. Pump tests under certain conditions can provide a wealth of knowledge about the system they are conducted in, depending on how the test is set up, the duration of the test and the proximity of nearby wells that are drilled into the same formations. We can approximate many things in regards to the properties of that aquifer system. From a pump test, we can calculate the total storage of a system, the hydraulic conductivity, the aquifer typed, confined, partially confined, unconfined, and we are happy to lend resources to do that during pump tests. The scenario we are most interested in is one that has what we call an observation well, which is a well in close proximity that draws down due to the pumping effects of the pumping well. If we, if we are available during a pump test and the landowner is willing to allow us on site to collect data, we will put loggers in the well to measure drawdown multiple times a minute. Keep, keep record of 
flow rates, um, providing there is a, a flow meter on site, set up an observation well to measure any drawdown effects in it, and do a bunch of math afterwards to try to calculate the unique properties of the aquifer system. We are also happy to share all of our findings and data collection with the pump company, driller, and landowner about what we were able to calculate, collect, surmise, and determine about that particular system. If it works out, allowing us to collect data can, can be mutually beneficial to both the department and the landowner. Uh, we get measured values of a system, or we get measured values of a system that we didn't have before, and the landowner gets more information about the system he is pumping from and a better understanding of what it is capable of producing in the long term. On these last two slides, we are going to discuss how we can change water velocity flowing into a well. There is likely some discharge the landowner is hoping to get or achieve with their new well, gallons per minute, acre feet per year. Uh, one acre foot equals 326 gallons, uh, two acre feet a year for 40 acres is 26 million gallons per year. Um, cubic feet per second are all discharge values or volume of water per some unit time. Well, efficiency is the difference between the pumping well water level and the water level outside the well. Um, think of the last slide, that well function shape of the water table around the well. It is the difference between the pre-pumping static water level of the natural groundwater elevation versus how far the well is drawn down by pumping. We can control the attributes of the aquifer underlying the landowner's property. I'm sorry, we can't control the attributes of the aquifer underlying the landowner's property, but we can control the well design, which can help us meet the landowner's desired outcomes. One thing to keep in mind, uh, anything over 0 0.3 feet per second can cause turbulence, which will result in sub substantial head losses. Um, also keep in mind that higher entrance velocities into the well can mobilize fine sediments and deposit them in the well. The steeper the profile or well function, think of Darcy's law, the fastest, faster water moves. We can't control the hydraulic conductivity, the properties of the lithology of the water bearing zone cannot be changed. Yeah, we can't change the hydraulic conductivity. We can't change the properties of the lithology or water bearing zone. Um, it is what it is. What we do have a lot of control over is the surface area of the well in the water bearing zone. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, as I stated in the last slide, hydraulic conductivity or the pore space in the water bearing zone can't be changed outside of, of fracturing or fracking. What, what, we, uh, what we do, we're, sorry about that. What do we do to get more water? If Darcy's law tells us the flux or velocity of the water through a surface, in this case, the well casing, um, and the discharge is the surface area times the velocity, then discharge is a function of both the hydraulic conductivity and the surface area. The formula for the area of a cylinder is area equals two times pi, which can be approximated as 3.14, times the radius, which is half the diameter of the well, and h, which is the thickness of the water bearing zone, plus two times pi, times the radius squared. Um, and again, pi is roughly 3.14, uh, radius is half the diameter. So a six inch well would have a radius of three inches. Uh, so three goes into 12, four times. So three inches is equal to roughly a quarter of a foot, or not roughly, I'm sorry, three inches is equal to exactly a quarter of a foot or 0 0.25 feet. And H in this case is the height 
Uh, in this context, it's the vertical height of the water bearing zone. So let's call it roughly 20 feet. Um, well, let's call it roughly 20, a 20 foot water bearing zone for this example. Uh, I did the math. The difference in surface area between an eight inch well and a six inch well is about 34%, which results in an increase of five gallons per minute. I converted well diameter from inches to feet because all the units need to be the same to convert cubic feet to gallons. Uh, there's There are roughly 7.48 gallons in a cubic foot. Uh, I threw in a hydraulic conductivity value and converted from cubic feet per second to gallons per minute. Um, when Whenever you try this, make sure that all your time and length units are the same. And it is unlikely that you will know the hydraulic conductivity. So the best way to use this is to understand the percent increase in surface area for casing or borehole diameter, which you can do in your leisure time uh, while not on site. What this can do is give you a tangible number to tell the landowner when they are deciding what diameter of well they want. Uh, an eight inch well may cost more, but it also increases their yield by 34% without decreasing well efficiency. And the result will lead to less sedimentation in their well, um, which will limit maintenance costs in the future. Um, another useful, uh, another way this could be useful is if, uh, if you're planning on drilling a, an irrigation well for a landowner and there's little, little to no information on irrigation wells in that particular area, you can figure out, you can, sort of upscale uh, the various domestic well information to calculate the diameter of, of an ideal irrigation well to get a particular usage rate. Let's say a landowner needs 800 gallons per minute to run a pivot. Um, you should be able to figure out the increased yield from an eight inch domestic well to how large a diameter of irrigation well you would need to meet that desired flow rate. So on this last slide is my name, position, and contact information. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to contact me via my cell phone or email. Uh, thank you for your time and patience and chugging through a little bit of groundwater math with me.